My name is Glenn Asner. I'm the Deputy Chief Historian for the OSV Historical Office. I'm here to welcome our speaker, Dr. David Kieran. Dr. Kieran is an Assistant Professor in the Department of History at Washington and Jefferson College. His research focuses on the relationship between war and society in the modern United States. His first book, Forever Vietnam, How a Divisive War Changed American Public Memory, was published by the University of Massachusetts Press in 2014. He's here today to speak on his latest book, Signature Wounds, The Untold Story of the Military's Mental Health Crisis, which meticulously examines the U.S. Army's efforts to treat and prevent post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury during and after the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq a topic that is deeply important and personally relevant to, I think, many people in the room here today. So thank you for joining us. We look forward to your time. Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming, uh, taking your lunch time to come down and and listen to me speak, and uh, especially on such a beautiful day, although it's 96 degrees with the humidity, so... We're inside, that's nice. I want to thank the OSD Historical Office for inviting me um, and uh, giving me the opportunity to come. And uh, this book really wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't had uh, the benefit of the openness of the Army. Um, When I reached out to people to talk about the research I was doing, almost everybody I spoke to was forthcoming. Everybody wanted to explain their part in this history. People were willing to give me documents, recommend people that I should talk to. So this is a... um, a nice opportunity to pay back some of the uh, openness that I've had. So what I wanted to talk about today is a section of the book that I thought would be most interesting and useful for people who are working in this environment um, and who are perhaps still grappling with how to address these issues. Um, So this comes from a section of the book where I uh, address or, or analyze how the Army attempted to change not just its ways of treating mental health and and what were the medical protocols that needed to be uh, put in place to better address these issues or what kind of research was necessary to understand them, but how did the Army need to also change its culture? Uh, How did it have to change the way people at all levels from the senior leadership down to the low ranking enlisted, how do you change the way they think about mental health? Because it's one thing to have top quality treatment. And it's another thing to have people who understand why that treatment is important and that it's effective. And so um, I'm going to share some of the ways in which the Army did that. And uh, at the end, I'd love to engage you in some discussion around that. So in January of 2007, George W. Bush made two decisions that reshaped the Army. The first was to adopt a counterinsurgency strategy that sent 30,000 additional troops. Now, this says 20,000, but as you know, it ended up being more than that, to Iraq as part of what became known as the surge, and that that required the United States Army expand deployments to 15 months. The second change was that President Bush nominated General George Casey to be Chief of Staff of the Army and to replace Peter Schoomaker. Casey, whose father was the highest ranking American killed in Vietnam, had been vice chief of staff earlier in the decade, and he had previously run the Iraq war for three years, um, a position that had earned him significant critiques. And during his confirmation hearing, then Senator John McCain bitingly remarked, while I do not in any way question your honor, your patriotism, or your service to our country, I do question some of the decisions and judgments that you have made. Whatever critiques politicians made of his leadership, Casey was genuine in his concern about mental health. I can't say that I went into Iraq with the notion that I needed to do something about PTSD and TBI, he reflected. But once he got there, the troops' psychological struggles were evident. He saw senior leaders struggling after attacks that left their men dead. He saw junior soldiers stoically trying to hold it together, quote, coming out of a memorial service and getting into a Humvee and going out again. Tucked into one of the many briefing books that he received as he was preparing for his confirmation hearings was a survey that that he recalls, quote, said that 90% of men and women in the Army would not choose to get behavioral health care because they thought it would affect their career. 
Casey remembers. 90%, that's a cultural issue. In his view, quote, the docs were doing their job, but the Army didn't want to hear it. The culture of the Army wasn't ready. However unready it might have been, the Army faced a clear need. By the summer of 2008, Army researchers estimated that the total number of newly identified PTSD cases for calendar year 2008 will be around 12,000, the vast majority of whom will remain on active duty. This represented a significant increase from the previous year's total of 10,523 diagnoses, which in turn dwarfed figures from the first three years of the war. More soldiers were on their second, third, or fourth deployments, and tours had gotten longer with little time off in between. Commanders were increasingly aware that soldiers were suffering, and the public and Congress demanded action. Changing the culture around mental health just became, thus became the primary goal after 2007. In particular, the Army faced three challenges. The first was reducing stigma, reducing the stigma that prevented people who had a mental health uh, issue from coming in and getting treatment. The second was making sure that quality care was more accessible. And the final one was addressing the reality that lengthy and multiple deployments were damaging the force's psychological well-being. Cultural change could not, however, be accomplished solely by issuing new orders. Instead, the Army's often halting, still incomplete, and never universally successful culture shift occurred through a more organic and grassroots process. It happened when medical department psychiatrists convinced soldiers that they understood their experiences. It happened when com they convinced commanders that they could help make their units more effective and when they convinced primary care doctors that they should take mental health seriously. It also happened when senior leaders began openly discussing their own mental health issues and how they had benefited from treatment. And these individual encounters grew into new programs that increasingly, though never quickly, rarely smoothly, and not always without opposition, came to define the Army's behavioral health efforts. The third issue the Army faced, the continued strain on the force brought on by multiple deployments was not a problem that leaders could solve internally. If leaders like Casey were used to giving orders to their subordinates, they also had to follow their civilian superiors' directives. And by 2008, several senior Army leaders became increasingly vocal about the demands that the country had placed on the force, implicitly chastising a culture that had sent a small all-volunteer all force to fight two protracted wars as they argued that the short rest periods between deployments denied soldiers the opportunity to restore their mental health. Addressing troops' mental health needs required an increased budget, better policies, and more clinicians, but it also required cultural change. The hi history of each of these efforts reveals where and how leaders, researchers, and clinicians succeeded at changing the Army's culture, where they struggled as they sought to change attitudes in a large, complex organization of nearly half a million people, and where they confronted a broader culture that remained largely disengaged from these wars. Perhaps the most significant issue that the Army faced was getting soldiers to come in for treatment. As in the civilian world, and I think it's really important as I think, talk about this, that the military is not unique in its reticence around mental health issues. The entire culture in the United States has uh, stigmatized mental health. Um, many soldiers looked askance at mental health care, thinking that whatever issues they were facing did not warrant care, that those who seek it are weaker, and that those who do not, weaker than those who do not, and that there is a risk of being public about their struggles. When your ethos is, I'll never quit and I'll never accept defeat, Casey reflects, you have a hard enough time getting people to go in for a broken bone, let alone something you can't see. In the military's culture, Soldiers fear, often with good reason, that admitting a psychological problem will be perceived as a sign of weakness. Research conducted by military psychologists, at, including those at the Walter Reed Institute of Ar uh, Army Institute of Research, RARE, confirmed that many service members, especially those with a significant need for care, did, not, uh, did indeed feel the pressure of stigma. One study, for example, found, quote, only 35% believed that they or someone else in their platoon might experience combat stress and 40% would not trust a returning stress casualty to be an effective soldier. So to address this, in 2007, the Secretary of the Army, Pete Guerin, ordered that every soldier in the Army be taught 
about post-traumatic stress disorder by October 18th as part of the, quote, Army MTBI PTSD Awareness Program. Central to the effort was a, quote, chain teaching model in which leaders taught material to their subordinates. In an hour-long session that featured, quote, a standardized script and supporting audiovisual products, including the ubiquitous PowerPoint deck. I don't know if you know this. You guys in the military have a thing for PowerPoint, right? Um, commanders would learn not to be skeptical of soldiers who sought treatment. Soldiers would learn not to worry that their buddies would judge them. And those who didn't think that mental health issues really required medical care would learn the error of their ways. In particular, the effort specifically targeted stigma, mandating, quote, the Army will care for soldiers and families of soldiers diagnosed with MTBI PTSD with dignity, fairness, and respect, and that, quote, commanders will address every MTBI slash PTSD incident seriously. In 2009, the Army would claim that the chain teaching program, quote, will reach more than one million soldiers, a measure that will ensure early intervention. The program likely benefited many soldiers, but presenting material to soldiers and changing the Army's culture are two different things. And the latter is probably too ambitious a goal for an hour-long PowerPoint session. Efforts to address stigma had to come from other directions as well. So one significant shift occurred when senior leaders inside the Army began to speak out about their own mental health issues. By 2007, nearly every colonel or general officer in a position of significant responsibility had shared Casey's experience in Iraq, quote, watching the impact of, culture, of, of combat on soldiers and leaders. Having faced these issues themselves and seen them in their troops, Casey suspected, they would be more willing to take action. What I was banking on, he recalls, was that there would be enough people that had that kind of experience that they would recognize when someone else needed help. He and his first vice chief of staff, General Richard Cody, thus encouraged leaders to be more open about mental health issues and to encourage subordinates to seek health. As Major General Gail Pollack, who was the interim Surgeon General, recalls, shifting the culture of mental health in the force meant, quote, the senior leaders had to have the experiences themselves in order to understand that, oh shit, if all my troops are having these experiences and I'm feeling this bad, I know they are feeling bad, and it became army leaders wanting to take care of their own. In her view, quote, it took Cody and his team, the four stars, telling people that it was okay. It took the senior sh leadership saying, we have to do the right thing. If we lead on behavioral health and say, you know, all this combat stuff is hard, then they are going to have permission to talk about it too. Given entrenched army culture, speaking about one's own suffering amounted to taking a considerable risk. In the war's later years, however, some senior leaders did become outspoken about their mental health issues. Most notably, Carter Ham, a four-star general who in 2004 had witnessed the aftermath of a suicide bombing that killed 20 troops in Mosul, uh, began speaking about his experiences. Uh, Casey, who flew to Mosul after the bombing, recalls how deeply affected Ham had been. To go in and see parts of his soldiers blown all over the place, he remembered, left courageous men shaken. Indeed, that carnage, along with the daily stress of sending soldiers on missions in which they were injured or killed, haunted Ham. In 2008, however, he began speaking out about his struggles as a means of encouraging lower-ranking soldiers to seek care. You need somebody to assure you it's not abnormal, he told USA Today. It's not abnormal to have difficulty sleeping. It's not abnormal to be jumpy at loud sounds. It's not abnormal to find yourself with mood swings at seemingly trivial matters. More important than leaders acknowledging their mental health struggles was their visibility when they sought help at clinics. This helped in two ways. First, when leaders benefited from mental health care, they became greater advocates of their soldiers getting it. Quote, if you see, if you help the NCO or the company commander or the platoon sergeant with their mental health issue, Army psychiatrist Colonel Chris Ivany explains, they become, quote, much more likely to recommend that their guys go over to get mental health. And the inverse was also true. When leaders were seen getting treatment, lower-ranking soldiers became more willing to go. As Gail Pollack asserts, quote, when people could say, hey, did you know that the command sergeant major was over there? Did you know that the old man was over there? It started to give them feelings of assurance that it's okay to go in and say, I need to talk about this. Nonetheless, many soldiers remained reluctant to acknowledge these issues, much less to seek help for them. For these soldiers, what some four-star general said mattered a lot less than what the people they worked with every day thought. 
making mental health visible and available in the units where soldiers worked and spent their time thus became critical. In early 2008, Ivany was in Baghdad where the 4th Infantry Division, there's Chris Ivany right there, uh, where the 4th Infantry Division was deployed as part of the surge. It was a brutal deployment and much of Ivany's clinical time was spent doing combat and operational stress control with units that had suffered a casualty. One of the primary challenges of his work was encouraging soldiers to seek help when the division psychiatrist came calling. One of the big variables, Ivany recalled, was whether or not they felt like their squad leader or their platoon leader or their platoon sergeant was generally open and accepting of behavioral health. Another question was whether soldiers actually had access to care. The embrace of counterinsurgency doctrine meant that troops were rarely on large bases, which meant that they had less access to mental health resources. Ivany thus had the paired tasks of making care available and making it something that soldiers were willing to take advantage of. To accomplish these goals, the Army began, quote, sending these officers and these techs out to smaller locations so they lived there. This was an effort to make behavioral health providers more visible and integrated parts of the units, and thus to become credible because they had had the same experiences that soldiers had had, or the soldiers in the, those units had had. Being there, wearing the same uniform as they are, sleeping in the same kind of locations as they are, sharing some of the hardships, speaking their language a little bit, quite a few of the guys came in, Ivany recalled. The success of putting behavioral health providers in individual units was thus one of the most significant lessons that he would take from his deployment. It was a lesson he would need in his next assignment. Ivany arrived at Fort Carson shortly after the Army Public Health Command had completed an epidemiological consultation on a brigade combat team in which several soldiers had been accused of crimes, including murder and attempted murder. The BCT at the center of the investigation had had a particularly brutal tour in Iraq. Uh, on almost every mission, on almost every measure, the unit had it worse than a comparison brigade combat team. More fierce fighting, more soldiers killed in combat, higher rates of mental health issues, traumatic brain injury, and substance abuse. The report concluded that there was, quote, a possible association between increasing levels of combat exposure for negative behavioral health outcomes. Access to care and willingness to seek it turned out to be a most significant issue. For starters, members of this brigade had significant difficulty getting treatment. On their first deployment, mental health providers had not been attached to the unit. On their second deployment, it, the brigade went abroad with a provider who had been temporarily assigned. At Fort Carson, the mental health staff was at about two-thirds strength, despite a 400% increase in the number of soldiers seeking care. More important, though, stigma had deeply penetrated that unit, and its leaders were disdainful of struggling soldiers. Psychological problems were dealt with in a very heavy-handed, unsympathetic way, Eric Schoemaker, the Surgeon General who had ordered the Epicon, explains. Soldiers were humiliated if they had problems. Some soldiers who received treatment had been subsequently viewed, quote, this quote from the report, viewed as weak, labeled as bad soldiers, and ridiculed, treated differently, and referred to as shitbags. The jailed soldiers told the Epicon team that leaders often made statements that paid lip service to behavioral health, but that their, quote, subsequent actions contradicted their message. They complained that leaders violated soldiers' privacy by, quote, public announcement of behavioral health appointments in formation and discussion about personal behavioral health issues where other soldiers could hear. Acts that made already reticent soldiers more reluctant to seek help. The story of this BCT was an extreme example of what happened when troubled soldiers were not encouraged to seek help, but the Epicon report spoke to wider troubles and a wider need to reduce stigma by fostering a better climate within individual units. Certainly, it highlighted the reality that a PowerPoint presentation was not going to be sufficient and that there were wider cultural issues to be addressed. Meeting these challenges required bringing into the garrison environment the strategies that Ivany had deployed in Iraq. When he arrived at Fort Carson, the care model was the same as it had been before the wars began. A soldier who needed behavioral health care would visit the post hospital and see a clinician. This arrangement created problems for soldiers and their leaders that in turn led some soldiers to be reluctant to seek care and some leaders to mistreat those who did. One issue was that soldiers had to leave their units and thus miss work in order to see a provider. 
Their conspicuous absence raised privacy questions and heightened the likelihood that they might be seen as, quote, bad soldiers or as malingerers. As Ivany remembers, the prevailing attitude among leaders when he arrived was, quote, I just send our guys up to the hospital. I have no idea what happens to them when they go up there. And there was no easy way to learn whether a soldier was deployable. The officers and non-commissioned officers didn't know the providers, which made them skeptical of whether those providers, in fact, understood the unit's needs. The solution was to implement the same protocol that had worked for Ivany in Iraq place mental health providers in close proximity to their soldiers and build relationships that facilitated better care delivery. Although they weren't officially part of the units they served, mental health providers were situated within the brigade combat team's physical space rather than in the post hospital. The clinical care didn't change. Soldiers still got counseling. They still got prescriptions. But what was different was that the leader and the soldiers had daily face-to-face -face contact with the provider. This realignment meant that NCOs and officers now dealt with one individual provider whom they came to know and grew to trust. As in Iraq, leaders responded well when embedded providers helped them deal with a struggling or problematic soldier. They appreciated when providers told leaders that a soldier's mental health issue was not a mitigating factor in a disciplinary matter or that a soldier could still deploy with a diagnosis. Whatever advice a psychologist or psychiatrist might give in a particular case, their honesty and their role in helping units stay effective slowly changed many leaders' perspectives. Even those who remained skeptical of mental health as a whole, Ivany found, came to see the value of their soldiers getting help from their providers. We're never going to change all those deeply held convictions, Ivany remembers. But he explains, they can still dislike mental health as a whole, and like Dick, Dr. Johnson right down the street, who sees all of their soldiers. So the Embedded Behavioral Health Program was thus fundamentally about building trust between unit leaders and behavioral health providers, soldiers from two parts of the Army that often did not see eye to eye. Embedded Behavioral Health is an Army um, briefing from 2012 explains, help mitigate privacy concerns because a trusted commission, uh, clinician could tell a commander that a soldier had a serious issue that made them undeployable without disclosing what that issue was and quote, the commander believes it because they have been working together. The embedded behavioral health program thus contrasted sharply with the chain teaching approach that had preceding it. Whereas the latter implied that stigma could be reduced and mental health care made more acceptable through an hour long training, the former understood that progress was incremental and individual. As Ivany put it, there's no magic PowerPoint in this. You have to build a consistent and enduring working relationship with these guys. Soldiers and their leaders were not the only people who had to be convinced to embrace mental health care. While many doctors in the AMED, the Army Medical Department, believed that behavioral health should be more prominent in military health care, the feeling was by no means universal. Here again, simply ordering people to do more screening and treatment wouldn't work. People have the idea that in the military everybody is in line and you salute, remembers Colonel Charles Engel on the left there. In reality, it's a lot more like herding cats. Engel was referring to, uh, and he goes on to say, there's a great deal of skepticism, and so it took some time for us to gain credibility. Engel was referring to his work on Respect.mil, the Army's initiative to integrate mental health screening into primary care. The program, which began in 2005 with a trial at Fort Bragg, grew out of his work running the program for Gulf War Syndrome at Rare in the 1990s. Through this work, Engel came to believe that mental health needed to be more prominent in primary care settings. The Army, he reasoned, needed to go where the problems are. And his, his rationale here was that most people who have a mental health issue um, first have a physical symptom. They can't sleep, they have chest pains from anxiety, and they don't turn up in a psychologist or a psychiatrist's office they go to their primary care physician first uh, and want those problems resolved. And, and so he believed um, in integrating mental health into primary care uh, as a way of identifying those problems and getting people into treatment. So he first described this problem to program to Congress in 2005, explaining, quote, the need to bring safe, accessible, and confidential care to service members rather than waiting for them to seek care and asserting that, quote, primary care affords an excellent opportunity to do so. 
Nearly every soldier saw a primary care physician, he explained, but very few saw behavioral health specialists. Engel's testimony was based on the pilot study that he had overseen among 82nd Airborne Division soldiers at Fort Bragg. There, Engel and his team used a civilian model created for depression care in which psychiatrists, quote, provide informal advice about to the primary care physician, clinician who treated patients and formally supervises the care facilitator. To ensure that the program met the needs of returning Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, they added in questions about PTSD to this screening for depression. And these would be very familiar to, any, well, anybody who's been in primary care setting in it recently, when you go in and get your blood pressure checked and they're weighing you and doing this, there's usually a few questions about your health and maybe a few questions about whether you're feeling depressed or anxious or so on, right? And that was the model that would get, um, lead to uh, greater uh, screenings. Um, often, the plan just re involved getting soldiers involved back into their hobbies, a healthy lifestyle, reconnecting with friends. In keeping with Engel's emphasis on recuperation rather than diagnosis, doctors were told that gathering, quote, detailed information about traumatic experiences is not recommended and that they should focus instead on current symptoms and circumstances. At the end of the 16-month study with the 82nd Airborne, Engel and his team found that, quote, approximately 10% of screened patients were positive for depression, PTSD, or both. Of those who entered the Respect.mil program and thus were monitored by a care facilitator, more than 80% had a clinically significant drop in their score on the PTSD questionnaire. And this is, of course, exactly what Engel had hoped. Quote, with basically only the added resource of a care facilitator, he wrote, we were able to screen and identify soldiers with depression and PTSD who would likely have gone undetected and untreated. And the majority of soldiers enrolled de demonstrated clinically significant improvements. This, he understood, indicated, quote, that respect.mil seems both feasible and worthwhile. Surgeon General Kevin Kiley agreed. When Engel briefed him on the pilot, he ordered that respect.mil be implemented on the 15 Army posts that had the highest deployment rates. Engel, as a scientist, suggested that they should structure the expansion as a clinical trial, implementing respect.mil at half of the site so they could measure its effectiveness beyond the pilot. Kiley, more concerned with the immediate needs within the force, insisted on a complete, immediate implementation. I'm the guy thinking about it from a scholarly perspective, trying to think about how we could do this in a way where we could learn something, Engel remembers. And he's like, let's just roll this thing out, man. As a result, by 2007, the program was being implemented throughout the Army. So two points are important about this. One is that however much Kiley was maligned for his management of Walter Reed, he clearly sought to expeditiously address soldiers' mental health. And as Engel recalls, he was really, quote, really quite good and quite attentive about mental health needs. As well, this moment illustrates a tension between the medical side of the Army and the operational side of the Army, where um, senior leaders on the operational side were often, tell me what I need to do today to help my soldiers. What, what do I need to do? And you have on the medical side people saying, well, we want to make sure we're very deliberate and we do a very careful study and that might take three years before we have some results. And, and that, um, those two professional obligations sometimes came into conflict with one another. Um, as Engel said, I believed it was better to make tiny, small, incremental change without mistakes than it was to take off and try to change the world in one fell swoop because errors could scuttle the entire program. But he recalls that Kylie, quote, grew impatient with us doing this, and he attributed some of this to my research background. The idea was that we were going far too slowly and far too analytically. So Engel threw himself into this work, quote, with almost religious fervor to convince people that this was the right thing to do. He and his team had already deployed, developed a training manual that outlined the significant number of mental health issues that returning veterans faced, pointed to, quote, the gap between the need for treatment and receiving it, and asserted that Respect.mil, quote, provides one step towards closing this gap by providing background needed for primary care clinicians to provide high quality mental health care that has solid evidence base for effectiveness. And it encouraged clinicians, quote, not to miss the chance to try the model at your first opportunity. Despite this entreaty, many clinicians were cool to the idea, and some were outright hostile. 
Given that psychiatry has historically enjoyed relatively low prestige in medicine and inside the AMED as well, this is perhaps not surprising. Moreover, most primary care physicians had little training in mental health, and many did not view it as part of their job. Gail Pollock recalls, for example, that when she attended a suicide training program at Fort Benning in the early years of the Afghanistan wars, many doctors and nurses had the view that, quote, that's mental health stuff and we don't go there. Engel encountered this firsthand as he encouraged AMED staff to embrace respect.mil. In the first year or two of the program, when I would go places, I would get nothing but resistance, he recalls. Some hospital commanders so resented his initiative that they didn't offer a handshake. At Fort Hood, the chief of mental health and the chief of primary care actively resisted him. There are multiple reasons for this. Territorialism among specialties, the sense that mental health care was somehow further down the hierarchy of what mattered in medicine, the sense that the Army primary care community had already been tasked with significant burdens after the creation of warrior transition units, and the idea that respect.mil was yet another task that they were being asked to take on. Making the project work was thus a long-term proposition. Just as stigma would not be eradicated through a one-hour PowerPoint presentation and a directive that troops wouldn't belittle their peers who sought help wouldn't work uh, effectively, Kylie's operationalizing respect.mil across the Army wasn't going to make individual physicians embrace the program or, more importantly, take mental health seriously. Rather, the program's success came through efforts similar to those that Ivany had embraced, building working relationships, getting individual buy-in, and allowing the process to grow organically. It was cultural change on a retail, not a wholesale level. Engel spent seven years traveling around the world selling the program at Army facilities, and it took a few years before he began to feel like most of the people he was talking with were willing to go along with his ideas. Largely, this was the result of his having cultivated relationships with doctors who embraced the program at one location, and then, as they got promoted and transferred, moved through the Army. Because I'd been running the program for so long, he recalls, they had switched jobs two, three, four times, and they would run into me at each of those places, so they got to know me. I got to know them, and there was trust established. Over time, they realized that the ideas I had were basically right and could be done and should be done. Increasing evidence that vindicated the program also added to success. By late 2011, nearly every primary care patient in the Army was being screened, leading Rand to conclude, quote, respect.mil is identifying a considerable number of service members who are reporting depression and PTSD symptoms. By July 2012, the Army uh, publication Stars and Stripes reported that, quote, each month 100,000 soldiers are screened. Successful efforts to reduce stigma and make care more accessible, like embedded behavioral health care and respect.mil, thus illustrate that changing the Army's culture happened from the bottom up. When an embedded provider helped a company commander understand why some specialist was showing up late to formation, or when a primary care physician screened a patient for de depression and referred them to counseling. This is not to say, however, that Army leader actions played no role in changing the climate surrounding mental health. During the same period that Ivany Engel and others were toiling with the, with outside the public sport spotlight, the Army's most senior leaders, Peter Schoomaker, George Casey, Peter Corelli, became vocal about the strain that repeated lengthy deployments were having on the force, implemented the chain teaching program, and fast-tracked these new programs implementation. In their congressional testimony, they increasingly called upon a culture that was largely detached from the military and from the wars that it was fighting to recognize that protracted conflicts could not be fought with as small a force as the Army had been asked to operate with. So in April 2007, the Army extended deployments to 15 months as part of the surge, a decision that Casey's predecessor, Peter Schoomaker, had made with the intention of helping soldiers and their families plan for a long deployment, because what had been happening was that the deployments were scheduled for nine months or 12 months, and then they would get extended. And the idea was that if you tell people from the outset that they're going to be deployed for 15 months, then families can, uh, can put into place some expectations and some plans. <coughs> This decision contributed to a broader anxiety that the wars were reducing the U.S. military's readiness, and that as one op-ed by two Democratic congressmen put it, quote, the U.S. armed services are literally at the breaking point. In particular, there was growing concern about the impact that long and depleted deployments with little rest, or dwell time, 
was having on the force. The research done by uh, the fourth mental health uh, advisory team, as, uh, sorry, mental health assessment team, as well as other research suggested that longer and more frequent deployments were damaging soldiers' mental health. The fifth mental health assessment team, which Paul Bleasy, uh, a colonel at the time, led in 2007 and whose report was published in February 2008, uh, surveyed 2,500 soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan. As in, men, as in MHAT 4, the results raised concerns. Soldiers' morale and mental health bottomed out after about seven months, while suicidal ideation peaked one month later. Alcohol abuse, in contrast, hit its high point right around the one-year mark. Quote, the model predicts a three-fold increase in the number of male E1 to E4 soldiers that will be positive for mental health problems at the 15 month of the deployment, Bleasy wrote. Later adding, quote, the adjusted percent of soldiers reporting mental health problems at month 15 is significantly higher than the percent reporting problems in the earlier months. So the, this MHAT report um, also looked at a significant number of soldiers who were on their third and fourth deployments with equally grim conclusions. Quote, an NCO on his second or third, fourth deployment reports significantly more mental health problems than does an NCO on his or her first deployment, the report revealed, as well as increases in, quote, stress or emotional problems that affected work performance, divorce rates, and alcohol abuse. That repeated lengthy deployments were causing significant mental health challenges was, unsurprisingly, a primary takeaway in the press. Quote, more than five years of recycling soldiers through Iraq and Afghanistan's battlefields is creating record levels of mental health problems, Greg Zoroya wrote in USA Today, before quoting Casey's admission that, quote, people aren't designed to be exposed to the horrors of combat repeatedly, and it wears on them. Addressing frequent deployment and shortened dwell times was thus a central goal. The Army set a goal of lengthening dwell time so that units would be spending three years at home for every year deployed, but was having little success in doing so among the pro amid the protracted conflicts. The Army had reduced the ratio to one to one early in the Iraq War, and then to 15 months deployed and nine months at home when the 2007 surge began. During my whole tenure, Casey recalls, it was a fight to get the Army back to one year out, two years back, and three years at home for every year deployed has got to be the norm. So one avenue toward accomplishing this was fighting the wars with a bigger force. And in 2007, the uh, Army leadership successfully lobbied the Bush administration to increase the authorized strength of the Army from 482,000 soldiers to 547,000 soldiers. But even as Army leaders touted that a larger force was a means of addressing the strain that the wars had caused, they knew that it would not solve the problem immediately. Increasing dwell time as the Army increased its size was thus dependent on reducing the number of soldiers who were required to deploy. This was a point that Casey's number two, Peter Corelli, made before Congress as he cautioned the lengthy wars and the lack of dwell time were damaging the all-volunteer force. In 2009, Corelli explained the imperative to the Senate Armed Services Committee by critiquing the, quote, increased deployments, shorter dwell time, and insufficient recovery time for our soldiers, their families, and our equipment. Corelli then admonished a culture that had not sacrificed much in the two wars it had decided to fight simultaneously, but and for in which it had asked much of the military. Quote, we simply cannot achieve the desired boots on the ground to dwell ratio until the demand is reduced to a sustainable level. And unfortunately, the Army cannot influence demand, and the current level does not appear likely to improve significantly for the foreseeable future. Corelli portrayed the Army's hands as tied, forced to fight two prolonged wars with a relatively small force. It had no choice but to, quote, ask a great deal from soldiers and their families on whom the strain had become nearly unbearable. Quote, it's a resilient force. It's an amazing force. But I have to tell you, it's a tired and stretched force, he began, adding that, quote, to turn around and go back to either Iraq or Afghanistan just under 12 months or just over 12 months, and have it be your third or fourth long deployment, it's difficult. It's difficult on soldiers and families. And he cautioned that, quote, the key is seeing the demand come down as projected. But if it doesn't, we'll have some issues. Internally, Army leaders were making the same point in 2010. 
In April of that year, Eric Schoomaker, the Surgeon General, wrote an email to Corelli calling dwell time, quote, the most pernicious element of the entire Army challenge. And he argued that, quote, it's time to draw a line in the sand which outlines emerging insights into the requisite time required to restore the baseline state of behavioral health and mental health, to restore family and community connections, and to recover from psychological and physical stressors of prolonged deployments and combat. In explaining why this was imperative, he likewise offered a subtle critique of politicians and a wider culture that didn't appreciate the human consequences of the long wars and perhaps didn't care to. The issue he wrote needed to be addressed, quote, before the bean counters conclude that one to one or less is tolerable and that an army in protracted war can be kept small or demand kept high at a one to one ratio. That, he concluded, is one of the real public health threats. So the anxieties acknowledged by army leaders should not be taken lightly. These men entered the army in the 1970s as the Vietnam War was ending, or just after, uh, a war that had nearly, in some sense, crippled the institution, and they'd spent their lives working to rebuild it. At least privately, they may have shared Senator Carl Levin's worry expressed in 2007 that the country risked returning to, quote, the hollow army of the 1970s. Their complaints certainly reflected this anxiety, and it was about as explicit as generals could get in critiquing a war or in critiquing the culture that had asked them to fight it. They also reveal that for all the Army's efforts, the ability to provide soldiers with optimum conditions for restoring their psychological well-being resides in large part with the public and with their political representatives. Nor were these efforts wholly successful, especially for troops with specialized skills. Even a larger force did not mitigate the demands for troops. Corelli remembers that, quote, my aviators in 2012, they were home for 365 days, and on the 366th day, they were back. So, between 2007 and 2011, the Army faced a growing population of soldiers who needed care, and they made important strides in making mental health care both more accessible and more acceptable. Although some issues, like personality disorder discharges, could be addressed relatively effectively through policy changes, the most effective change happened at the level of individual relationships among soldiers, clinicians, and researchers. But for all its success, the Army's efforts to reduce stigma and improve access were never universally successful. When the Army did make progress, it did so incrementally and sometimes haltingly and always at the grassroots level. Only when individual researchers and doctors or soldiers and providers built meaningful relationships did attitudes about mental health begin to change. And while those projects resulted in significant success and eventually spread across the entire army, they did not fully succeed in eradicating stigma or ensuring that every soldier gets the care that they deserved. Nor could they compete with the profound and prolonged demands on the force. So the story of the Army's efforts to improve mental health care between 2007 and 2012 then is a story of both success and failure, of a complex organization learning how institutional, institutional change takes place and learning it under very trying circumstances, and dealing with the ramification of being both beholden to and part of a culture that enables war while stigmatizing mental health. I will pause there and uh, happy to take some questions or have some discussion. But thank you, Joel. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your methodology, your source base. I saw you have sure. FOIA documents. Yep. There are a lot of firsthand um, quotations that you were pulling sure. in your talk. Could you talk a little bit? Yeah. So I, I used uh, I think three primary, um, four primary archives in a sense. Um, one was uh, media coverage and publicly available government documents, so congressional hearings, reports that the Army produced, uh, things that are, are publicly available, you can find them on, online. The second was I filed Freedom of Information Act requests um, through the Army FOIA office, and I don't know if there's anybody here from FOIA, you're wonderful. Um, and if you see somebody who works in the FOIA office, thank them, but uh, they sent me thousands of pages of material on PTSD, on traumatic brain injury, on Army family programs, 
Um, and those were really useful because, as, as you know, the National Archives has not received in many cases and certainly has not processed and made available many of the contemporary uh, documents from the Army. So FOIA documents were very important. Third was that, um, as I mentioned at the outset of my talk, people inside the Army were almost universally willing to speak with me and share their experiences. Everybody from Pete Guerin, who was Secretary of the Army, George Casey, Peter Corelli, um, all of the people who served as, a sur as Surgeon General during these wars, and then down into the level of individual researchers and clinicians, people like Colonel Ivany, um, Colonel uh, Hogue, who is a, a, a major player in this, um, Colonel Engel. Uh, universally, they were willing to talk about their experiences and share their experiences and to refer me to other people who they had worked with, and, and so I was able to do a lot of oral history work. And then um, several of those people also provided me with documents that they had um, kept from their time in the service and, and said, you know, you, here's, uh, so, so the email, for example, that I had from General Schoomaker to General Corelli, um, that was a personal uh, communication that was handed to me. Um, and then the, the last thing that was available um, was, um, were, were the, the, again, those published Army uh, documents, so manuals that they put out, like the Respect.mil manual, the Army Suicide Prevention documents, and, and so on. So um, it was a challenge sometimes to, to decide what the archive was, and I, and I know that when you get 3,000 pages of documents from FOIA, there's probably a lot of other documents that didn't get into that FOIA package. Um, but I think that we, uh, I was really fortunate to have the broad base of stuff to work with that I did. Sir. So, great presentation, Doctor. Thank you Thank for you. coming, Jimmy. Um, it, it sounded as though the Army was reacting to problems that they saw at the time, and your data is about seven, eight years old now. I'm curious about whether, uh, for the present and the future, whether there's any proactivity, whether any lessons learned are being extrapolated and used today, or whether this is going to be lost at this point. Oh, I think the most important lesson of this book that I wrote and that, um, that I, I talk about and I think I hope is taken, which I hope is taken seriously, is that it provides some lessons for people who are thinking about the Army's future needs or the future needs of any of the services. Um, and when I talked to General Casey, I said, what do you think the most important thing somebody who reads this book should get? And he said, they need to make sure it never falls off the table again. Now, as we wind down from these wars, you can't just not take mental health lessons from it. So. To answer your specific question, there are some things that are still ongoing, the embedded behavioral health, the uh, screening in primary care. But the uh, Army's major initiative after 2012, or, or coming into 2012 and continuing, was the move to comprehensive soldier fitness and then comprehensive soldier and family fitness, CSF and CSF2. And what those were aimed at was um, building resiliency among troops and building psychological resiliency, but also creating a um, uh, kind of wraparound model of, of treatment so that soldiers were, um, wherever they entered the care stream, if they was, whether it was through um, primary care or through substance abuse treatment or through mental health or some other avenue, that they would be able to be referred out to a, uh, a wider uh, uh, network and that their care could be assured. So the question, and, and that there was a lot of tension about the, the question of resiliency, and I, I can talk about, about that idea. but. Um, the, the key thing is that many of these programs have continued. Um, they've morphed a little bit as they've been um, included in comprehensive soldier fitness and co comprehensive soldier and family fitness. Um, but I think the Army has been working proactively to take these lessons and take these initiatives they developed and to make them permanent so that they will continue to be available to soldier and soldiers and families. Um. I think this comes from a historical perspective, looking at how this problem in the Army developed. I'm thinking of um, you know, looking at like Eric Dean's work, where he talks about Vietnam and the Civil War, mm -hmm. in the sense that you, you can't really have post-traumatic stress in there when no one knows it exists. So as we get more recent, you know, was this something the Army could have actually prepared for as the cultural acceptance of PTSD was expanding and growing? Sure. So as these wars were developing, was this a matter of the Army being Kind of behind the eight ball or just having to kind of address it internally? Yeah, so the Army had spent a lot of the time in the 1980s and the 1990s thinking about combat stress and what are the 
reactions that an individual is likely to have if they're in a combat environment. And that led to the development of combat stress, combat and operational stress control doctrine. The challenge that the Army had was that they never anticipated a war that would last 17 years or 18 years now in the case of Afghanistan and uh, depending on how you count in Iraq, nine years or so. Um, and the, I, the notion that soldiers would be deployed multiple times and what the mental health implications of repeated deployments were was something that the Army hadn't planned for and, and couldn't have planned for because that was not the kind of war they had ever anticipated fighting. Right? Um, and you can go back and look in um, documents from the 80s where they're really thinking about, okay, well, if we fight the Soviet Union in the Folda Gap, that war will probably last three days. And so we'll be in this very acute kinetic environment. There will be behavioral health issues, but they will be acute. And, we, and the, the Army is actually quite good at treating that. They know what to do when soldiers have acute issues. What they have had less awareness of was PTSD because by the 80s and the 90s, there were very few soldiers. By the time 2001 comes around, there were very few soldiers in the military who had PTSD. You know, it, was, it was something you would be medically boarded out for. Um, and people, there weren't very many Vietnam veterans still in the military by 2001. There weren't many people who had significant combat experience. Um, and so the attitude, um, as was described to me inside the Army, was the VA deals with PTSD. The Army doesn't. And so there wasn't a lot of expertise inside the Army, and they had to build that capacity up. So, so were they behind the eight ball? Um, yes, in a sense. Not through their own fault. It was about what kind of war do we imagine fighting. They were prepared for that. They were not necessarily prepared for the uh, psychological ramifications of, of uh, what, you know, the era of prolonged conflict. Yeah. Did your research include comparative studies like uh, or extended uh, mostly counterinsurgency type operations like uh, the Israeli Defense Force in Lebanon and their very long mm -hmm. period of operations there? A, a, a country that has a similar attitude towards mental health, mm -hmm. and medical care in particular, very Western oriented, mm -hmm. but in, in a very similar type of operation. So in my research, I didn't do a comparative study, but I did look at a lot of the work the Army had done where they had really chosen Israel as a model for um, this kind of comparative work that you're describing. So for example, throughout the 80s, um, a lot of Army research would, would point to the 1973 war and say that this is kind of the model for how we anticipate, back to your question, what we anticipate a war in, in Central Europe will look like. Um, now, I'm not sure, and maybe um, you're more aware of this, and, and, and I'd love to hear more about it, uh, if there is still ongoing comparative work being done where the Army uh, researchers in the U.S. are looking at Israel and counterinsurgency in Israel, because I haven't encountered anything like that, but I think that's fascinating. <coughs> Is there any work um, comparing, uh, how, did you look at statistical work um, comparing soldiers in different situations and mm -hmm. gender distinctions? Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, the Army's MHAT reports, the Mental Health as, uh, Assessment Team, so there are now, I think there's nine of them now, nine or ten of them now. Uh, those would break down those units, uh, the, the, the data sometimes by uh, MOS, and also uh, I, I don't know that there's particular data on gender on that, but in the MHATs, the, especially in the fourth MHAT, there was a section that really talked about and attempted to um, argue that you couldn't, in a sense, argue that there, was, there were combat units and non-combat units in Iraq because everybody was in a potentially hostile environment. It wasn't Vietnam where uh, even in Vietnam, units that were in, in, in brutal combat, um, the, those combat interactions were relatively brief and they happened at some remove from a, a, a large base where people were relatively safe. And so combat units were, 
cycling in and out of a combat environment in Vietnam, but as in, in Iraq, they were constantly at risk of being mortared, at risk of encountering an IED or something like that. So the level of stress was, was uh, dispersed in a certain sense across um, different kinds of units and different kinds of specialties. Now, one issue that I wanted to write about in the book and didn't have space to do, because the book's already 400 pages long or something, is to look at military sexual trauma and the mental health uh, implications of that. And uh, I think that's an issue that really deserves a lot more attention and needs uh, a lot more study. Um, but one issue that um, has come up particularly around um, women in the services is the psychological impact of, of sexual trauma and, and whether the military was prepared uh, and proactive in addressing that. And I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, what I haven't seen is any indication that women in combat or women in combat roles are any more likely or uh, to have a mental health problem as the result of their service than a, a male soldier. I, don't, I haven't seen anything and I don't know that there have been studies that have looked at that. Okay. There's a comparison maybe with the, uh, the Israeli Defense Forces. They have universal, they, they have universal service. So the entire population shares that burden and understands that. Mm -hmm. We have a graph uh, that these problems will only really come up as a result of eliminating the graph. Mm -hmm. There are fewer and fewer percentages of the people that are joining the military voluntarily, these days, how it goes, there's fewer and fewer joining the army and everybody wants to join the Air Force because even less people want to go into the Marines and the Navy. Mm -hmm. So I think the debate over... Is this good? Is what, uh, what I see when I'm asking is the inference here mm -hmm. is that we don't get back to a universal draft, then we're looking at some dire consequences if we face another protracted war. Well, there's a pretty profound and enduring debate over the draft and the all-volunteer force. Right? And I would point you to Beth Bailey's book, uh, America's Army, because um, she does a really nice analysis of the history of the ABF. I think f the reality we see from this data is that when you send people on three, four, sometimes more deployments without time to reset, the incidence of mental health issues goes up. So Corelli, General Corelli put it really quite well in his congressional testimony. It's a simple matter of supply and demand. If the country, and I think the country then, not just in the military but as a whole, needs to be realistic about what kind of conflicts um, should the United States enter into with what kind of military. And when we think about resources and uh, aspirations, that's the balance that needs to be struck. Because uh, it is not sustainable, from my view and from my, my conclusion, from my research, to have prolonged wars in which you're sending people on 15-month deployments with nine months of rest time. That is, a, that is not sustainable for their mental health. And, and it leads to problems down the road. So the question then is, do you grow the force? Or do you not send people on, do, do we not get involved in protracted wars, right? And so um, you can change that, that metric in a couple of ways. You can increase the supply, you can decrease the demand. Um, and so as we have that debate about an all-volunteer force, um, I would encourage us also, and as a culture, to have a debate about what is the role of the military and what do we ask it to do? Because in this century, we have asked a very small number of people to do a lot, and we have seen what the consequences of that for their psychological well-being are. Uh, and I think it's, it's true in this military, and this is another, just as a, a quick, quick aside, the all-volunteer force is spectacular. It's the best military the United States has ever had. It's the best military the world has ever had. And people who join this military do so because they want to be in it. And one of the issues that came up around this was, okay, well, you want, if people join because they want to serve, and they join because they want to deploy,
encouraging them to get mental health treatment is a good thing because it keeps them deployable. It keeps them healthy. If you, if you create a culture where it's not valued and it's not uh, supported, then what they do is they end up having an undiagnosed mental health problem that eventually gets them boarded out or maybe disciplinary case out, right? Um, but the challenge is, if you have this group of people who want to serve and want to deploy, uh, making sure that you keep them healthy and making sure that you ask them to do things that aren't going to be detrimental to their mental health unnecessarily uh, becomes the key, I think. Yeah, we're, we're, we're in a fallen world, too. This, I came across this recently, mentalhealthamerica.net, mm -hmm. 2018 report. One in five adults have a mental health condition. That's over 40 million Americans. And that, that's, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a cultural problem. It's not a military problem only. Mili mental health is highly stigmatized in this country. And um, I think the Army, in some ways, has been more proactive than the rest of the culture. But I'm happy to talk to you individually uh, if you have other questions. I want to thank you again for inviting me. Thank you all for coming. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.